Hey guys, this is John and welcome to another climbing the rating ladder video. I'm playing pink Yeti. Let's play a Scandinavian. It's my first video of 2024. Happy New Year, everyone. All right, playing my favorite opening. What's not to love? Okay, and we're in the main line here. I'm going to go queen a5. This is the subject of my upcoming course, which I hope to release in two or three months. It's a complete Scandinavian course, but it focuses on queen a5 which is uh, the most common position you'll see in the Scandinavian most of the time, this knight c3, queen a5 line. Okay, knight f3, let's play knight f6. We're almost always developing our kingside knight here. We'll play bishop f5 in this position. White is playing one of the main variations. Lots of options here for white, bishop c4, bishop d2, knight e5. Yeah, now I actually faced this in a game in Charlotte, North Carolina uh, last year, in May, I believe. And I played this move, knight bd7. It's a bit of an unusual move, but the idea is that white is actually not threatening much against our queen right now. Although their bishop is lined up here, knight, knight c3 to d5 is not a threat yet, because we could take with the queen. And if knight b5, we can play queen b6. So there's actually not a lot to fear with white jumping this knight. And I like playing knight bd7 here, because it keeps white's knight out of e5. There are some instances where white can quickly jump that knight into e5, and black really has to know what they're doing to try to neutralize it. But if we play this now, we rule that out. Okay, and interestingly, white does go ahead and attack our queen. Let's drop the queen back. And depending upon what white does here, yeah, a4, looking to go a5, I can think about kicking their knight back, either with a6 or c6. I'll just pause here for a moment debating which one to play. I think they're both quite acceptable here. If I play a6, a5, I would have to go queen c6 at that point. That does look fine. But I think I'll probably go with c6. That's a bit more customary in this type of position, allowing the queen to retreat to d8. So c6, a5, queen d8. I don't see any tactical tricks that white has there or anything. I think white's probably just going to return their knight to c3. So let's go ahead and play that. It's fun in the queen a5 Scandinavian, though. You get very used to playing chicken with this bishop on d2. So I talk about that at length in the course, how to deal with instances of white trying to line up with your queen. So we do see white playing pretty aggressive here, but they're going to have to retreat now. Knight back to c3. Maybe they'll go knight a3 and try to angle for c4. But either way, I think we're, we're doing just fine. Okay, and white does play knight c3. Now, I have half a mind to play a6 here, just to force white to keep that pawn on a5, prevent them from advancing further. I like the look of this. I'm going to do it. I feel like I've made enough development strides already. Yes, even though my queen has gone back to d8, white has wasted some time with knight b5 and then back to c3. So I'm just going to put... The complete breaks on the a6 plan make sure that this pawn st stays here for the time being. Bishop c4. Let's go ahead and play e6. This setup is extremely common. Black putting pawns on c6, e6. Classical Scandinavian stuff here. Now, I wonder if later on this a5 pawn could become a target. It's one thing I may look to exploit if I can. Perhaps bishop b4 somewhere. I don't think I have to rush to play this move, but I'm going to have my eye on this pawn. Good opponent here, by the way. 1927. They seem pretty confident. Knight h4. Okay, so now white's using the other knight to try to harass me, going after the slight square bishop. I could drop back with bishop g6, but I sometimes like tickling here with bishop g4. Definitely leaning in that direction here. Attacking the queen. Trying to induce f3 or maybe get white to retreat bishop e2. I don't mind playing these positions after knight takes g6, h takes g6. But let's, let's see how white reacts to bishop g4. That often is a critical thing to do if it's allowed. I'm going to bet that white plays bishop e2. Yep, and they do. Now let's just go ahead and trade. Yep, 
I'll play bishop e7. Time to get castled. And we're going to look to castle short. Okay, white returns the knight from the edge of the board. So another knight move. It's kind of funny that already in this game, white has played the knight back to f3 and the knight back to c3, aside from their original developing moves. <clears throat> All right, let's just castle short. And I think white's probably going to do the same. And then we're going to settle into a middle game where I think everything is normal for a Scandi, except the fact that white has pushed this pawn all the way to a5. Now, I could maybe see that being useful for white in some outside case where they play knight a4, b4, and then knight c5. It's kind of a long-winded plan, though. And even then, they get a bit more purchase on some of these squares. Uh, okay, they play knight e4. So white's really delaying castling. I wonder if that's for any particular reason. I can't think why that would be helpful for white, but you never know. So first thing that crosses my mind is trading and then playing knight f6, winning a tempo on the queen. Let's say queen back to, to e2, maybe queen d5. I think white's trying to unblock their c pawn in general. That's my read on this situation. I'm tempted to go c5 here. I think c5 is an option as well. If I could somehow capitalize on white keeping their king in the middle, that's nice. But I do think that's a little bit hard to pull off here. Kind of looking at, you know, standard moves. The knight capture, the pawn break. Any other moves up for consideration? Could play something standard like queen c7. But I don't mind exchanging and trying to break out a little bit here. So definitely looking at these ones. I won't spend too much time on this move. I do want to make a timely decision. <laughs> I feel like C5 is the principal thing to do here. So I'm going to go ahead and play C5. Those of you who play French or Carol Khan, you may relate to this type of structure. There are similarities compared to the Scandinavian. So. Challenging white's pawn on d4. I just think that makes white a little uncomfortable when they're behind in development. Okay, white persists in keeping the king in the middle. c3, reinforcing move. So I wonder now if I can think about getting aggressive. This might be the time to do it. I'm thinking take on d4. If white takes with the knight, I swap on e4, and then I play knight c5, maybe with e5 in mind. I could foresee a circumstance where I can land a knight on d3 with check. I like the look of that here. I think this is going to be the time to pounce. Let's take. Ooh, and white instantly takes with the C pawn. Okay, so I was not even really considering that option because it gives white an isolated pawn, but they had that pre-moved. So now if I trade knight f6, there is queen takes b7. So maybe I'll work up to the trade. I could also put this knight on d5. Rook c8 looks pretty good here. I want to try to. Maybe flirt with coming into C2. A lot of decent looking options. Anything else? I think Rook C8 looks fine. Rook C8 castles, Rook C2 perhaps. I get a little pressure going there. I think White can navigate that pressure, but I should have a small edge now. Should have a bit of an advantage. So let's go ahead and do it. This is a no increment game, by the way. So more reason to try to play quickly if I can. Okay, any problem with rook c2? Not that I see. The rook is undefended. But I don't see how white's going to profit from that fact. So let's go ahead and do it. Attack the b pawn. Maybe they could try to trap the rook somehow behind enemy lines, but... I don't know. We'll assess after, after White's next move. That can change things. <laughs> Always can, right? And I might just play Queen C7, Rook C8 here. Look to triple up on the file. Uh, there is some back rank potential concern, I suppose, if White plays Rook C1. But again, it kind of depends what White does at this, at this juncture. Okay, White plays Rook F to B1. 
Rook F to B1. Not again, not a move I would anticipate per se. Okay, so I think the question is if I play this queen c7 move, can white go knight c3 and try to trap this rook? Maybe. Yeah, maybe that's legit. Maybe I just swap on e4 and then play queen c7. Uh, they still have rook c1 at that point. A little bit annoying. So I can back rank them, but I'm not quite seeing it. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'm just going to drop back to C6. Not exactly a glamorous move, but I don't want to have to calculate Knight C3 when I'm at three minutes on the clock. Maybe White will oppose me with Rook C1. But I could always play Queen C6 at that point, I'm thinking. Or Queen C7, rather, and take on C6. Okay, so I'm still liking this position. I still feel like I'm a little bit better here. Nothing crazy, but a little bit more comfortable. Okay, knight c3. Maybe some d5 ideas white's thinking about. Yeah, queen c7, there's d5. So perhaps bishop d6 is an idea. Hmm. Bishop b4 looks a little loose. I'm not so sure about that one. Rook e8 is another idea. Maybe a decent move, but I think white's going to go b4 sometime soon. Hmm. Actually, let's go bishop b4. Yeah, let's play this move. I'm going to make a play to try to stop White from pushing their B-pawn. Because I, I just noticed that I'm hitting this pawn. I mentioned this way back when. But in hitting that pawn, this move looks annoying for White. It feels like the right move, too, to stop this. Okay. Now, two minutes. <laughs> it's, it's the two-minute drill in chess. Again, no increment. So let's speed it up. First YouTube game of 2024. Got to try to get the dub. All right, 95. Yeah. All right, let's take. I imagine they're going to take with the pawn. Maybe they'll take with the queen. Try to defend laterally, but they do take with the pawn. Yeah, let's go knight d7. If I play knight d5, that invites a trade. So I'm trying to retain this idea. And now e5 is a little loose for white, too. Okay, bishop f4. So I think they're just letting me take this. I could also take c3, but I'd rather take this one, if given the choice. So let's snatch that pawn. Maybe they're going to go here. I'm thinking bishop c7 at that point. Yeah, start trying to. Attack e5, stop knight d6 as well. Okay, so this, this position feels good. I definitely feel like I'm making significant strides here, but I need to be careful. Let's play this. I wonder about bishop g5. They could try that, and then something like f6 looks interesting. I'm not 100% sure that works, but I won't have a lot of time to figure it out. Okay, they step there. Should probably step out of the way at this point. Go queen c8. Hmm, now they jump in. Okay, well, I'm happy to see that because I can take. Mm -hmm. Rook c2, e5, lots of options here. Let's go e5 as if they take rook e8. And next, I'm going to try to get this rook in the game. Maybe rook e8, rook e6. Attack this pawn.
Yeah, I like rook e8, get this last piece in the game. Love this knight blockading from c7. That's an important piece. Ooh, also, white now can't play rook c1. If they had kept their bishop on this diagonal, rook c1 might have been in the air. But now I feel like I'm fully in command. Target this pawn. Yeah, let's go ahead and play rook e6. Now, I might not want to take this pawn immediately. As I do notice there's some issues potentially with bishop takes e5 at the end. But I can work up to it. Maybe uh, like rook e8 here or h6 or something. <clears throat> I think they see the same thing. I don't have a lot of time to think about this. Let's just try to play a useful move. Let's go h6, just like they're doing. long as there's a bit of a lull. Again, might play queen e8. Oh, there's also queen b8. Okay, queen b8 might be my next move. Try to target the pawn with the queen as well. Yeah, that looks decent. I am still on the same diagonal with their bishop there, but I think that looks pretty good. Queen b8. Let's do it. Ooh, can they play bishop takes e5 here? Ooh. No, that doesn't work at all. I take with the knight, and I hit their queen. I was wondering if they could play bishop takes e5 and then d7. But fortunately, I don't think that works. So they go there. Uh, I can just take. Let's do it. Okay. Now maybe rook e6. Yeah, time getting low for both players. But I think for now I've got everything under control. Knock on wood. These 30 seconds are going to go fast, though. We got to play quick. Ooh, aggressive move. Uh, let's go here. Attack that bishop. F5, maybe rook e7. Trying to guard this square still. take i'm just gonna go here try to simplify Rook check i think it's fine to do that i don't think f6 works for them mm, i'm allowing some trades though i don't know if i should have done this might be hard to win this position did they go there let's push Ah, check, though. And I pick up the rook. Okay, that is clutch. The fact that we pick up the rook. Let's just put the brakes on this. Actually, let's trade queens. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Even more useful. Cut off the king. Oh! Oh, man. Nicely done, John. <laughs> hey, you know, first game of uh, the year. You gotta work the jitters out, right? Let's pre-move. <laughs> you know, just giving up material for no reason. <laughs> All right. Well, we cut it close, but we got the job done. Fortunately, they took my, um, my hindmost pawn in that situation. Right. I don't know why I played a4. I was expecting them to go king d3. Or no, no, no. I was expecting them to go king d5, actually, to try to break this cage situation. So that was a pretty foolish assumption. I didn't even pre-move a4. Just a bad assumption. And slow reaction time. So yeah, thanks to Pink Yeti for, my, for uh, my opponent for the game. 
Interesting one. Definitely tense. I mean, they put the pressure on in the middle game. Again, I do feel like I had a bit of an edge. Let me turn the engine off for a second before I look at the review. But, you know, White took their chances. They tried to make things sharp. Round about here, Bishop F4, Knight E4. I do wonder if White had played Bishop G5 and maybe Knight F6, if I moved the Queen, if that would have amounted to anything. Engine's probably going to say no, but looks scary, especially when you have less than two minutes. On the whole, I'm pretty okay with how I played this. We'll check if C6 or A6 is better here. I might even have this in my course. I don't specifically remember uh, Knight B5, but I don't think this is a critical, critical move. The main move here is Bishop C4, trying to renew or threaten this Knight C3 to D5 thing, in which case I would have played C6. So we'll check that briefly. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like White played a little loose with with keeping their king in the center for so long. And yeah, they gained a little bit of space, but I, I definitely wasn't impressed by this voluntarily, voluntary um, isolated pawn that they took on. That said, I mean, it wasn't all that easy to get through here. The whole rook c2 thing, I actually think this might be wrong. I decided not to keep my rook on the second rank because I, I got worried about knight c3 closing the door on the rook now that this pawn is defended. So maybe white was plotting that. Uh, possibly, yeah, possibly I should go knight d5 here now that I look at it. Although knight c3 is still annoying, even here. Even if I take and white takes with the pawn, because now I've got this to worry about and the rook is still trapped. So I'll be curious what the engine has to say about that. Yeah, I think after white played knight d6, I'm doing very well. I feel like this should be a technically winning position. White does have the pawn advanced pretty far. You know, it's two squares away from promotion. But a knight is such an awesome blockading piece. One of the best blockading pieces directly in front of this past pawn. And I felt like I had things well under control here. Most importantly, because I was in time pressure, this simplified my task in trying to win. I didn't have to think about as many threats with white having the knight on board. So. I think if I were to single out one move that lost white this game, it was probably knight d6. That said, I mean, there was some tricky stuff otherwise. Like, even here, I wanted to take this pawn, right? But I kept seeing lines like this, where there's an attack on my rook. I can't take with the knight because white takes my queen on c8. I'm seeing now I could maybe go here. Then there's this, and the pin persists maybe i play queen c6 threaten checkmate I mean that's probably good but i'm not winning material here as far as i can tell so there were some tricky things i wonder also if anything was missed yeah like here knight d7 mm, probably knight f6 is just a more natural move here i was playing with fire a little bit i mean white really went for it f4 I played this knight h5 move, perhaps knight d7 or something. Could cause me some problems. I was mostly hoping to clarify the situation with their bishop. Here I saw an interesting line. Where was it? After queen c6? So two things. For one, I think white can trade queens here and then, let's say, check king h7. Go attack one of these pawns. I don't know if this is winning for black. Uh, I do have this protected past pawn, but white's suddenly pretty active, and they're going to win one of the pawns back. So despite being down two pawns, they're going to win one of them back. Maybe this is a technical win, because this pawn is pretty strong after all. I wonder if, let's say I play f6 or something, and we get some scenario like this, if I can win it. Try to threaten this eventually. Mm, not 100% sure. But the thing I was really flirting with here and not a great situation because I have 23 seconds left is this move f6 this discovery f6 I did see that I could play queen takes queen and then on pawn takes white's ready to promote with the help of the rook but fortunately I have checkmate here <laughs> queen f4 is mate so I didn't plan all that out but I, I did see that I had that resource here so 
We'll see if white missed anything concrete. Yeah, I think once they move the queen, this is, this is now winning. And I did see queen c7. Okay, a little shaky from here. Gave the rook up, but I'm going to give myself a break. First game of 2024. Okay, let's click into the review. Oh, my opponent wants to be friends. I will always accept your friend request on chess.com. So if you want to send it to me, go right ahead. I'm very happy to have you guys as friends. I have more friends on chess.com than I have on Facebook. <laughs> so, all right. So 79.7 accuracy for my opponent for 89.5 for me. Yeah, from the looks of the graph, it looks like I had things pretty well under control. There is a bit of a spike here, which I think is around where I was mentioning White could have won that pawn in the rook ending. So let's take a, take a look. So Scandinavian defense, where we try to knock out this pawn on e4 straight away. Yeah, and this is such a common line. White playing the tempo gaining move knight c3. In my course, I look at all reasonable and some unreasonable move two and three alternatives too. So if white plays knight c3 or e5, for example, those are common moves you see at amateur level as well. Uh, even stuff like knight f3, which is the Tennyson gambit. And here on move, move uh, number, number three, if white plays knight f3 instead of knight c3, that's another common branch. I analyze that extensively. If they play d4 as well, I also look at that extensively. A few other things too. But when you play Scandinavian, most of the time you're going to get this position. And it's kind of nice for black because whatever move three that you play, and these are the three most popular and commonly accepted move threes for black, queen d8, queen d6, and queen a5. If you play the Scandinavian for long enough, it's a virtual guarantee that after three moves, you're playing a position from um, a position of familiarity much more than your opponent is. And that happens pretty early in the game. Again, move three. And I don't think there's too many openings where you can say that. So I always like starting from a position of comfort in this opening. So queen a5, this will be the subject, the main recommendation of my upcoming course. I do have a course on chessable on queen d8, which is a very solid move. It's a little bit passive, but very, very solid. Probably the simplest move to play here for black. And the other one is queen d6. I personally have not played queen d6 very much, but um, I know Magnus Carlsen has dabbled with this. He occasionally plays this in Blitz and Rapid. I got to turn off this feedback because I feel like it just gets overwhelming with the number of highlights and dopamine that chess.com is inserting into your brain with all these exclamation points and various colors and things. <laughs> I recommend you turn it off too if you want to analyze soberly, making sure you're not influenced by the engine too much. But yeah, queen d6, perfectly legit move too. I feel like this is the most complicated of Black's three options available because the queen is a little bit in limbo here. I can try to attack it in various ways. And it may wind up on d8. It may go elsewhere, like b6 or even b4. The queen's a bit in flux from here, but this is a good option as well. But I've always liked queen a5. This is actually the line that I originally started playing in the Scandinavian. So I won't go too deep into the theory at the moment, but knight f3, knight f6, d4, this is such a common position. If you're higher rated, you can expect to see this sort of thing all the time. Bishop f5. There are instances where black will look to put the bishop on g4. But in my course, I will generally only recommend that when white is delaying the development of the kingside knight. Okay, so for example, if white plays d4, knight f6, and then a non-kingside knight move. So bishop d2 is a really common one. Bishop c4 as well. Against those moves, I'll be recommending that black play bishop g4, attacking the queen and trying to induce white to either step into a pin or play this move f3, which is a little bit weakening, in which case uh, we're going to look to come back to d7, actually. So just a little bit of preview of, of what's to come in the course there. But once they've committed the knight to f3, we're usually gunning for this f5 square. The bishop's very well placed here, and we're ready to, ready to play e6, getting the bishop outside the chain. Yeah, now bishop d2. Lining up with the queen, 
Alternatives are bishop c4, bishop d3, bishop e2, and also knight e5. Knight e5, I think, is actually one of white's most challenging moves here. It's a move the engine uh, feels pretty strongly is one of white's best. White has ideas of g4, knight c4 to hit the queen, also bishop c4, lining up against f7. This is a dangerous line that I spend a lot of time looking at in the course because black has to know exactly what to do here. Leads, leads to some really interesting positions, by the way. But okay, bishop d2. And like I said, it's important to realize when you're playing the queen a5 Scandinavian, you don't have to overreact to bishop d2, especially if knight d5 is not yet a threat. We take a good look around when bishop d2 hits the board. Can white play knight d5 on the next move? No. The answer is no. So we don't need to play something like queen b6. I mean, we could, but... We don't need to. It's not necessary. We could play c6 here. Uh, you can even play e6, which I don't recommend for a particular reason, but it is concretely decent. But yeah, I, I like this move knight bd7 as well. And again, I'd refer you to this game. I, I played against this player. Um, his last name is Rastelli in Charlotte back in May. I did a video analysis of this game. And I talk about why I like this move order. It's mainly to prevent this knight e5 move. And again, we're able to do it because this move isn't working, which would otherwise hit the queen and create a problem on c7 and just take the knight in that case. Other knight moves, I mean, knight e4, we're not particularly concerned about. We can drop the queen back. And if takes, we don't want to damage our pawns. We don't even have to do that. And you saw what happens on knight b5. So... The main move here after knight bd7, the theoretically critical move, is bishop c4, which does threaten this knight to d5. So here's where I would play c6 if this came up in order to meet knight d5 safely with queen d8. And notice that we have this knight backed up if white takes. But my opponent, Pink Yeti, played this move knight b5. And let's throw on the engine here. I'm kind of curious. Just its knee-jerk reaction about that move. So yeah, you can see bishop c4. That's the top move here. h3, bishop, eight, bishop e2. <clears throat> Nothing particularly concerning there. So this does hit the queen, but queen b6. Yep, a4. Okay, and it looks like a6 and c6 are pretty much neck and neck here. I don't know how much stock to put into this chess.com engine. I do think this engine is pretty weak a lot of times, but it's, it's good enough to... You know, for a cursory analysis. A5, not a move I considered because I do like booting this knight. But that is interesting to see that A6 and C6 are pretty much neck and neck here in terms of value. Oh, uh, so why are you giving me dubious, chess.com? <laughs> you guys saw it. It's on video. A6, oh, it's doing me dirty. Now it's saying A6 is plus eight-tenths of a pawn. Or sorry, eight hundredths of a pawn. <laughs> I feel like chess.com is doing what Lee Chess did to me in my last video, where it's saying the Scandi is, is an inaccuracy. Big chess, man. It's a big chess conspiracy against the Scandi. <laughs> All right, well, we'll have to suck it up. Yeah, C6. I mean, I did end up playing A6 in the future, so I, I could buy a very high-level argument that A6 is slightly more accurate. And again, if, if white plays a5 here, ah, I don't even have, have to play queen c6. I can actually go queen e6 check. And this buys time to take the knight. Okay, that's worth noting. That's worth noting. So that didn't occur to me in the game because I mentioned you know, I could go knight c6. But yeah, queen e6, that would have been a quick way to win a piece. Not a guarantee white would play a5 because they can go knight c3. But good to know. And then e6 and continue developing from there. Okay. All right, I learned something. I think next time I'll try this approach. I don't think you want to take this pawn on b2, by the way. This looks a little greedy. White can play rook b1 and queen takes here. I guess black can get away with capturing here. Even this type of situation, I do think white has pretty good play. Threatening rook takes c7. But yeah, bishop d3, I mean, that seems like a tough move. Take, take. I guess the point is maybe rook b1's a threat now. Apparently, white has some compensation here. 
Okay, maybe playable, but I probably would have just gone E6 had this position come up. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, real close call. But anyways, I play C6. White does go A5. That gets the X clam. But we've prepared our retreat. Knight comes back to C3. What issue does it have with that? It says white can try A6. I did wonder about that briefly. I just didn't really believe it because I thought this would be good. Bishop A5. Uh-huh. And then take this with check. Interesting. I feel like I'm using the word interesting a lot after the Kramnik ordeal, so I apologize for that, guys. <laughs> yeah, I didn't look at this in the game. If a6 had been played, I mean, I could always play b6 here if I needed to, but taking the knight is certainly critical. Possible I would have just decided to do this. But that is a benefit of the a6 move. I'll, I'll return to this moment. Playing a6 does stop white. Completely puts the brakes on white playing a5 followed by a6. Okay, so C, c6, a5, queen d8. White returns the knight to c3. I thought there was an outside chance white could go here and try to direct the knight to c4, by the way. But they play knight c3. I go a6. Again, gets the dubious mark, but seems marginal. If e6, I just didn't want to allow this move. I'd hate to break up my pawns, and I thought if I move the b-pawn, the c-pawn becomes a little fragile early on. But looking at this again, yeah, this is probably not a problem. I do have to watch c6, but then again, white's a-pawn is pretty extended. Looks overextended in a lot of middle games, I think. But I feel like we're splitting hairs here. a6 looks normal. Bishop c4. Yeah, I mean, this, this, can I turn off this feedback? Like, this is really bothering me. It's like every move dubious. And I don't really think that's warrant, warranted. In my opinion, dubious should be a move that moves the eval by like 0.25 or more, maybe. I don't think one tenth of a pawn should warrant a dubious mark. Most of the time. Okay, so yeah, knight h4. And th this is, again, standard. I've got a normal Scandinavian setup here. Light square bishop outside the chain. Knights talking to each other. In my course, a lot of times you'll see the queenside knight go to c6, by the way. But this is not one line where that occurs. The only real difference is that white has thrown this a pawn up the board in kind of modern style. You guys probably know the engines often like to do this sort of thing, aggressively pushing a flank pawn. But it's not without risk, because you saw later on that pawn was lost. So it's not completely without risk to do that. Yeah, and I was a little surprised how ambitiously white played this, keeping their king in the center. Like knight h4, bishop e2 wasn't exactly surprising, but it did feel like white kept their queen out there for a long time. Yeah, now I wonder, wonder why bishop e4 didn't cross my mind. Because looking at it now, that does seem like an accelerated version of the game. I think it's because with white's queen on e2 opposite my king, my natural reaction was to want to get castled ASAP. I didn't want to have to contemplate uh, bishop uh, knight to f5, trying to use the pin and threatening g7. But in this exact position, I can actually just castle and defend the pawn, and then I'm threatening the knight. So yeah, looking at it again, this move looks challenging because I am looking to play bishop takes a5 so I can see why knight d1 or knight d1 is a suggestion trying to trade bishops. All right, so bishop e7, knight back to f3, castles. Really thought white should castle here, castle short. I don't think white's going to castle queenside when this pawn would hang. But knight e4, I spent some time here, probably a little too much time for a 10-0 game debating whether to take or play c5 or go queen c7. You can see all these moves are actually in the top three. It does even indicate that this is playable. I was hesitant to give up b7. I'm sure there are concrete reasons why that's acceptable to do, but that's probably not a decision I want to entertain in a 10-0 game. 
So I'm pretty happy with C5 here. And I thought white was just going to swap on C5. Or maybe allow me to take, but more likely do something like take. Uh, or lead with this knight, perhaps. We could get some middle game like this. Where I think it's pretty level. Again, there's some crossover to especially the French defense. You can get this middle game where black has a majority stretching from the E file through the H file. And white has a 3 versus 2 a majority on the queen side. So, yeah, equalish position. In the short term, white might find it easier to mobilize the queenside pawns compared to black mobilizing this majority. But it's hard to make much of that. There's a lot of pieces on board. Black can use the D and C files. Black has a good outpost on D5. So, pretty balanced. Yeah, but white played this move C3, which did feel like a mistake, and the engine does agree with that. Take. Now, I thought white would take with the knight, whereupon I was planning knight takes knight, followed by knight c5, hitting the queen and defending b7. And then let's say white goes to e2. I saw that I had this move e5 to kick the knight from d4. And the plan is to try to land knight d3 check. And note that if white takes the pawn, knight d3 forks and wins the queen. So I was looking forward to this operation. I thought I'd gain a nice little edge out of this. But white had pre-moved c takes d4. So anti-positional, but actually probably not that much worse, if at all, than knight takes d4. Because in the latter case, knight takes d4, I do get an initiative. Whereas this at least prevents my initiative from taking place. Okay, now interesting here to me, guys, that knight b8 is the top initial engine suggestion. That actually makes perfect sense in light of what happened in the game. Because I don't think I articulated this during the game, but I felt like my knight on d7 was constantly misplaced here. I'd rather have it be on c6 to help pressure d4 and possibly a5 as well. And from c6, it wouldn't interfere with my queen uh, on the d file. Because on d7, I can't hop anywhere forward. I'm sort of relying on a trade of knights to occur at some point. So I can send that d7 knight through f6 and route to a square like d5. So that is super interesting and instructive to me. That's a high level move, knight b8. It's instructive to me that the engine has that up there, trying to repurpose the knight, improve the knight to the c6 square. And in the engine's estimation, it's worth two moves to do that here. And maybe that's how I get some sort of advantage. Yeah, queen d5, rook d8. I can lay long term siege to this isolated pawn. And by the way, uh, isolated pawns, maybe I'll do a video on this at some point. They're not always weak. I think there's a tendency to kind of hand wave around isolated pawns and just instantly declare them weak. They can be used in an offensive capacity. And there are certain openings that are entirely based around accepting an isolated pawn and trying to use the activity like on the adjacent files and sometimes the free-flowing piece activity as a means of compensating for it. It may not just be purely a weakness. But in this case, with that pawn blockaded, black having a safe king, white not even being up in development here, I think it is more of a liability than anything else. Okay, so we got that trade. And I went with this rook c8 plan. Yeah, and I was really starting to burn some time here. And again, I, I just had trouble making something like this work with, with b7 always being loose. That was a constant annoyance here. So that is one effect of this pawn on a5. I can't easily play a move like b6 without allowing a trade. This pawn on b7 is kind of nailed to that square. But I really like this knight b8 move. That would have been a hard move to play over the board or in this online game. But I see why. And I bet it's going to recommend it on the next move too. Yeah, it's up here on the next move as well. I can see why the engine likes it. Yeah, so rook c2, tempting, but I kind of felt that was a mistake. I might agree with the, the, the chess.com dubious mark on this one. Because I did end up retreating this rook pretty quickly here. But I thought for now, this made sense. Pinning their bishop, threatening rook takes b2. I was a little surprised by rook fb1. That doesn't look like the most aesthetic move to me. But maybe white was thinking, if they use the a rook, then... Um, can I possibly take here? Uh, maybe that doesn't work. 
was thinking about trying to use the pin. Uh, probably my rook gets trapped again. Knight c3. Yeah, look at this. That rook can get trapped behind enemy lines. Rook d2 and then knight d5 with the discovery. So sending this in behind enemy lines this early was probably premature. It's probably just flat out premature. Still a tiny, tiny edge for black. But in hindsight, I think this knight b8 c6 plan is the way to go. But yeah, I was a little surprised by rook fb1. Then again, my instincts are somewhat validated here because the engine does show that black should retreat this rook to c7 or c6. So I'm, I'm glad I had the discipline to uh, refrain from playing a move like this, which looks consistent, looking to double or triple on the file. Because knight c3 slams the door on that rook, and suddenly white's threatening to trap it and, and win it. I'd have to give up an exchange here. So, okay, rook c6, and I thought white might just want to play rook c1 here. Again, maybe they were hesitant to do that with a5 being loose, but I don't think concretely I can do much. Because even in the case of a swap, this bishop remains guarding this pawn. The white played knight back to c3, which was also annoying. One of the top moves. b4 is another decent looking move here, by the way. Trying to go b5. Yeah, I could probably try for something like this and now use the, the d5 square. But I feel like white's getting some counterplay at this point. Yeah, something like this. White feels like they're doing all right at this stage. because They've got some activity to compensate for the isolated pawn. So rook c6, knight c3, which was annoying because um, I eventually found this bishop e4 move, but I was tempted to just move the queen. Again, like queen c7 or something. But there's this move d5 as soon as I move the queen from guarding the bishop. And whichever way I take, whether it's pawn takes, allowing queen takes e7, or if we insert the knight trade first, I lose this bishop. So I don't know if white was calculating all these nuances. You know, sometimes you get the feeling your opponent is not looking at all of the tiny tactical details that you are, but I can't rule it out, and I got to play objectively what I think is the best move. So I was satisfied with bishop b4. Maybe I should have played this way back when, when I played bishop e7, but nice to find this here. It prevents white from playing b4, and it hits this pawn on a5. So white jumped in. Not bad. I guess it's showing some line, rook d1. I mean, that's a very hard move. Where I guess some dynamics allow white to compensate for losing that, that pawn. Some wacky line like this. Where it looks like I'm all pinned up. Yeah, this doesn't look like fun, but <laughs> the engine says it's okay. Yeah, I think for practical reasons here, I'm probably just at least slightly better, if not clearly better. Because I think white's going to lose this pawn and they're going to have to scramble to come up with some compensation. So they played this knight e5 move. Take, take, knight d7. And then bishop f4. Interesting move because that gave me a choice of captures. But if I, take, if I take on c3, I didn't like opening this rook towards b7. Maybe I could do this and kind of slow play it. But that didn't quite feel right. So I played bishop takes a5. And then they went knight e4. I think that's correct. Bishop c7, correct and reply. Both getting the exclamation points. Yeah, now around here, I was wondering about this bishop g5 move. If I had more time, I would have calculated this. Because this might be complete garbage, but let's check. Knight f6. Yeah, I can take with the pawn. Okay. Yeah, this looked mildly concerning, but I think concretely nothing really happens here. I can play king h8 in the end and then rook g8, preventing the queen coming to g7 with mate. I guess I could also, yeah, like if they play bishop h6, I could probably just take on e5, like with the knight here if I needed to. Yeah. Guards against this. I'm very happy to go into some position 
like this with two minor pieces and uh, two extra pawns for the rook. Okay, so I was kind of seeing some ghosts there. Bishop g5 with this knight f6 idea, maybe in conjunction with queen g4, looked annoying, but it probably doesn't stand up. And they could do something like this too, though. Play a move, spend a move on f4 to try to guard e5, and then try to brew an attack on the king's side. I think this still would have been a little tricky because on the king's side, white has a, a bit of a grip going on. White played rook d1. I went queen c8. Wow, very interesting to me that the engine says knight d6 is the best move here. I would not have anticipated that. As you guys heard me talk about in the game and immediately after the game, I actually felt like knight d6 was a big mistake and possibly where white lost this game. I would definitely not play knight d6 here. I wonder if the engine just thinks the problems with e5, because now that I'm unpinned, I am threatening to take. If the problems with e5 are concrete enough that white needs to play this move. But yeah, like queen h5 looks reasonable. I wonder if there's even some trickery uh, with, a, with rook c1 or queen g4, possibly. Maybe not, though. Maybe. But again, the engine always has the benefit of seeing all the resources in advance. So the engine doesn't have to try to connect the dots in a way that a human does. Uh, all the dots are already connected for it when it's spitting out these evaluations. So it sees that on queen h5, that black can play, I guess this move rook c4 with counterplay. In rook e1, f6, like these moves look a little disconnected to me. But I guess I see the point that there's a pin here. White can't take. Fascinating. So knight d6 gets the x clam, but I really thought I was in command. Maybe I was just so happy to get rid of that knight. <laughs> the most annoying piece in chess, the knight, that I, I welcome this move. I, mean, I really feel like black should win from here, but maybe I'll run this on my local PC and see how much of an edge it gives. Black's up a pawn. I feel like this pawn should be more or less doomed in the long run. But maybe that's not the case. I mean, maybe white has enough to eke out some counterplay and some chances for a draw here. I thought e5 was clever because it severs the bishop's defense of the pawn. White cannot take because of rook e8. I'm pretty confident in saying that. f4, f6. This should win pretty trivially for black. Wins a piece. Yeah, and I, I felt like here white should keep the bishop on the c1 h6 diagonal. So a move like bishop, bishop to e3. So that white has the option of rook c1 if they want in the near future with the bishop assisting in the defense of the c1 square. And it's showing how maybe rook d8 and some sort of knight move to attack this pawn could be played. This felt a little more active for white, something along these lines. So I was happy to see bishop g3. I felt like the bishop was kind of out of the game there. Yeah, they do keep the bishop trained on that pawn on e5, but I'm not going to let white win that pawn straight up. And again, it's nice that white doesn't have rook c1 anymore. So just taking my time here. I'm playing methodical, even with a minute and a half left. I still need to get my rook in the game. It doesn't like queen g4 so much, but... White's still evaluation-wise in this game. And then this was clever, h3. And I, I give white credit. I think they did see here that if I take twice on d6, white has this move, bishop takes e5 because of the pin. And then I need to have rook g6 here, otherwise I'm going to lose material because white is threatening checkmate and threatening the rook. So we already analyzed this. I don't think this is much for black. It is up a pawn, but I didn't think I needed to pull the trigger on this yet. To capture on d6. So there you go. Okay, h6. That is the top move. Yeah. When both sides or one side uh, gets to a position where it's a little slower, the immediate tactics have slowed down. You've dotted your I's, crossed your T's in terms of the big picture concrete stuff. 
you can afford to, and in fact, you should look to play moves like H6. These little improving moves. Now, I don't have to worry about a back rank problem as much. Just a handy move to play here. I wish I wouldn't have taken 17 seconds with 120 on my clock, but <laughs> you get the point. King H2. Okay, now it is saying I could take. It's kind of the same line, though. Queen B8 seemed reasonable to me. That is up there as well. Okay, so I ended up winning this second pawn. I didn't take with the queen because I didn't want to allow queen takes b7. I'm going to take with the rook. There's still just some annoying counterplay for white, though, even though they're up, or rather down, two pawns. Thought I was doing a good job of keeping everything nice and tight here. When you're in time pressure, you want to play coordinating, harmonizing moves. I don't want to throw a piece down to the second rank or something. Uh, I'm trying to, to play mostly in terms of coordination, king safety, trading, retaining my material advantage. Okay. Yeah, and F4 gets the dubious mark according to the engine, but I actually think out of the circumstances, that was a pretty good try for white because it's hard for white to throw much else at me here. They sort of exhausted ways they can create an attack without using their F pawn. So I don't mind this move at all, especially if I have to find eight seconds to invest eight seconds to find knight h5, which does appear justified. Yeah, so I'm trying to go after the bishop, trying to pressure the pawn on f4. I guess rook d7 doesn't lead to anything. Oh, because I can take here. Oh my. Check that move out. And if takes, take here and rook e1 mate incoming. I don't think I would have saw that. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. I think I would have played rook C, uh, queen c6 here. So they went f5. I played rook e7, guarding the square, continuing to guard e8. Queen here. I took the knight. Fortunately, this hits the queen as well. So there's going to be no trickery. Yeah, and queen c6, I, I did identify that as a mistake afterwards. It does look better to play f6 here which prevents any issue with white playing f6. I still got to watch mating nets. Like if ever this rook can come down, I know I can take here, but if they could get some scenario like this with queen g6 coming in, uh, that's something I got to watch with this particular structure. But concretely, I don't think there's any danger of that. So yeah, f6, play king h7 next, and maybe work up to some way to dislodge white's queen. Maybe the plan is uh, after king h7, rook d7, try to swap rooks or gain control of the d-file, maybe rook d4, if white doesn't swap. So a little nervy here, queen c6, I'm, I'm looking for trades. Yeah, and had white traded queens and played this rook ending, and I was debating whether this is a win or not. Uh, yes, black is going to be the one pressing in this ending, but I'm going to lose a pawn, and probably I get flagged against a fast opponent here unless they mercifully give me a draw. So that was, that was absolutely the way to go for white. And they still have a chance here after throwing in the check. But white moved the queen, and then my e-pawn is breaking free. The e-pawn's dangerous, and I have queen c7. And that's why white needs to offer a queen trade right here, queen d6. Still not too late to do this. Yeah, the e-pawn is off to the races. I might even do this push the pawn all the way, and then try to win this pawn ending. But here too, this would have been a race against the clock, even though I have the two versus one on the queen side. So I think if white had swapped queens, this would have been dicey with the clock situation. Another reason I recommend playing with an increment, by the way, guys. These games, as you can see how long this video is, I tend to play them at a quicker time control, but 15 plus 10 is the minimum I recommend for improvement. You really need an increment. You need to consider your options. Have a bit of a buffer from these crazy time scrambles. As long, and also a, a slightly longer base time control too. Yep, and now queen e3. And then fortunately I saw this fork winning the rook. Yeah, it's still a little shaky after this. You guys saw me lose my, my rook. <laughs> Assuming white was going to go king d5. But uh, got the job done.
And you know, here too, if white had not played king takes b5, of course black's winning here because this is a known scenario with these pawns where they, they hold each other. Because as you saw, if white takes the hindmost pawn, the front pawn runs. But to win this, if white had shuffled with their king, I would have to work my king all the way around and either come over to assist these pawns or more likely what I would have done raided white's pawns over here, which is time consuming, and then try to make a pass pawn. Yeah, I think a lot of good bullet players like Daniel Naroditsky would have no problem winning this, probably with even half or a quarter or less the amount of time, but <laughs> I, I'm not so sure I'm confident in my ability to win that under the time circumstances. But white took on b5, and then fortunately I was able to make a queen really quickly. And this was easier to win. Okay, fascinating game to start the year here. Thanks to my opponent, Pink Yeti. I'm going to let them know that I um, made a video on this game. I always welcome feedback from my opponents. Yeah, and a good little preview of what's to come in my course in the next two, three months. This is a dynamic line. It's much more dynamic than the Queen D8 Scandinavian. But I find the positions fascinating, and they're so much fun to play. The Scandinavian gets written off as like a boring opening. It is not boring, guys. There are many interesting avenues here, and I love playing from a position of familiarity compared to my opponents. The Scandinavian just doesn't get a lot of love, even though I personally have been uh, evangelizing it over the past several years, but it still doesn't get a lot of love. You will find opponents who are quickly in unknown territory because they just don't bother to study it much. So this was a fascinating game. Thanks again to Pink Yeti. and. Yeah, I was surprised by some of the moves, but the speed at which White played them and the problems that they were able to set me at various moments didn't make this easy at all. And even in the analysis, this is why we analyze our games, I found surprising stuff like this knight d6 move. I didn't think that was a good move, but the engine says, no, that's actually probably White's best chance here. And it's still difficult to win this position, especially had White played bishop e3. Also, I'd point to the moment early on when the correct plan roundabout here was actually to reposition this knight to c6. Because on d7, I didn't have so much future in jumping forward with this knight. Had I found this idea, which does actually crop up from time to time, I've seen examples of IQPs where this is the maneuver. Had I found this, I think this would have been a, a different type of middle game. I would have had more direct pressure on the isolated pawn. All right, thanks for sticking with this, guys, especially if you're uh, in the analysis gang and you watch this portion of the video. I know a lot of people do click off right after the game's over. I don't hold it against you if you do. But the analysis is where we really learn. I always look at my games afterwards because even to this day, having played chess competitively for uh, 25 years, I'm constantly learning stuff, guys. And that's why I love this game, among, among other reasons. So let me know what you picked up from this one or if you have any questions. And let's make the most of chess in 2024 and hopefully improving our own game. I'll be right there with you guys. Thanks again. I'll see you guys again soon.